Welcome to the College Knowledge Podcast, sponsored by the College Planning Network and Paradigm Financial Group. Whether you're searching for that right fit college, applying to college, or figuring out how you're going to afford it all, you're in the right place. You'll hear from deans, admissions counselors, student athletes, and scholars from esteemed universities and colleges around the country. We'll dig deep to uncover their insight and unique experiences. So whether you're a student gearing up for college or a parent with college-bound kids, sit back, relax, and listen. Like hey guys, you, don't forget, we have send lots of anyone questions. our way who needs our help guests with college the answers, or who is sending and we're a student to, to share them with you. College Let's planning the right way requires an expert. Book a free consultation at EliteCollegiatePlanning.com. All right, everybody. Welcome back to College Knowledge. I'm your host, Dave Kozak, alongside my co-host, Mr. Joe Kearns. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of interviewing uh, Dr. Bob Selmer, and he is the Director of Acoustic Program and Laboratory Department of Mechanical, Aerospace, and Acoustical Engineering at the University of Hartford. Dr. Selmer, welcome to the show. Great. Great to be here. Thanks. So this is, uh, this is one I'm, I'm very intrigued by because we've never had anyone in your, in, in your lane whatsoever on the show. Um, and I think, first of all, I don't necessarily understand it all. So I'm looking, why don't you give us a little background on yourself, how you got into this, and what you really focus on as your primary practice at uh, the University of Hartford? Okay. So I'm actually a graduate of University of Hartford. And at the time when I was here, they had a mechanical engineering degree where you could do an acoustics concentration. Okay. And that worked very well for me. Uh, unfortunately, they actually started this even more unique program called acoustical engineering and music, but that didn't come along until I was in my junior year. Okay. So rather than go back and uh, pick up classes I was missing. I just continued with the mechanical with acoustics concentration. Mm -hmm. But I've been a piano player since I was in third grade in school. And being able to combine my my love of science and tinkering with things as well as with music, it just all seemed to come together uh, with this program. So that's really why I chose this avenue. Got it. So so a passion led to a, well, I guess two passions where they collide was where you found kind of the inspiration of that. Exactly. And the acoustical engineering and music program is really like a bullseye for so many people. I wouldn't say there's maybe a lot of people like this, but for those that find this program, they all to a person will tell me that it's exactly what they were looking for because they usually had been in band or some orchestra playing all through grade school into high school. Then in high school, they found they were doing really well in their math and their science classes. Mm -hmm. And they kind of felt like they were at this fork in the road at the end of high school. And their parents, many of them would say, don't be a musician, you'll starve. <laughs> and other, the other students would retort, you know, but don't, don't make me end up in a Dilbert cubicle, you know? Yeah. And so this was exactly what they were looking for because they were able to continue on at a conservatory level training as well as get a very marketable degree in engineering. And we literally have more job offers come in than I have graduates to place. Well, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating kind of connection because a lot of times when you're on the musical side of things, people tend to push you towards the arts as opposed to the sciences and the maths. And I think understanding that distinction that there is an entire uh, math science component of all that that people need to explore and not we, we talk a lot on this show about um I, I call it head trash but the preconceived notions that people have and and put on someone else and and that idea that if you are musically inclined then you you're on the artist side of things and it's okay to be an artist and know the science and perfect that stuff right i mean i think that's what what you're really saying here Exactly. And the students in the program, I call them my renaissance people because they truly have chops in both areas, both yeah. rather than just being a straight ahead engineer geek uh, and or a very, very artistic musician. Uh, these people really know how to blend both. And then that's really what creates their passion. Mm -hmm. And and I know, you know, for I, I watch a lot of documentaries, so you have to pardon that part of me. But um you know, the music business and industry, you always hear about the sound engineers and you, you hear about it, but you don't, you don't really, I don't think I've ever really thought like, what is that? And what do you do? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm guessing it's not only the understanding of what makes beautiful music, but it's how the sound comes out, how the sound travels, how the sound is recorded, how all of this kind of plays out in the, you know, the multi-user interfaces that we all have now, you know, I get music at my fingertips in any moment. Uh, is that what, what you 
is that what a degree like this would would lead to? Well, that's a good distinction to make because really the word engineer, you know, gets thrown around in mm-hmm. many mm-hmm. contexts. And I think we can both begin by saying, all right, we're not talking about driving a train. Yep. Uh, but it's also what our program is, is is not a recording program. Okay. So there's really three fields in the, in sound in general. One would be, you know, a recording person who's working the knobs and needs a musical background in order to under follow a score and do edits and these kinds of things and have an appreciation for the musicality of it. There are technologists who work in audio. They're going to be more, say, working for companies that do sound system installations or repairs or maintenance or testing. Mm -hmm. And then there's acoustical engineers. The key word for an acoustical engineer is design. So this would be designing the recording studio in the first place, designing the loudspeakers, designing musical instruments, uh, designing concert halls, designing hearing aids, designing uh, highway noise barriers that you've driven by designing quiet cars, quiet jet engines, uh, the list goes on and on. So it's all about designing things from the ground up. That's fantastic. I would have never known. Like, yeah. I, uh, again, you know, cruise to engineering was going, okay, obviously there's sound involved with this, you know? Right. And so, you know, a quick little, uh, Wikipedia search <laughs> and I say, Oh, this is going to be a fun, uh, uh, episode here because it was hey noise control right and then right. it went into the, the the stuff that i was saying hey outside of that it was ultrasounds and medicine uh right concert halls the or, or the or, you know an orchestra how things are heard and then it was like railway stations so that announcements can be heard better i was like okay exactly. it's one of those things we hear it all the time where <clears throat> it's these things day-to-day life that you go through you don't realize all the work that potentially goes into it on the back end uh so it was i was intrigued by by hearing this so um yeah it was like oh wow there's a lot of applications of this which then makes sense would you say there's the jobs that are offered for more students than you have. There's a lot of applications for this. Is there anywhere in particular that you typically see your students go to when it comes to those jobs? Is there any number one that t- tends to stick out? Well, I can go through. There's actually six different areas that okay. our students end up in. And so the first one that would probably be most familiar to most people would be audio design. So okay. that would be loudspeaker companies like Bose, mm-hmm. uh, any number of uh, electronics outfits like that have acoustical engineers on board. The next category would be architectural engineering consulting. Okay. And so these are, these are consulting firms that would be hired by an architect to make the building come out right the first time so that they yeah. don't have to come back and band aid bad acoustics after the fact. So they would be working off the plans and what the uh, architects are dreaming of. And the arch- acoustical engineers will help make suggestions so that all of these goals are met for the first mm-hmm. time around. Mm-hmm. The next category is musical acoustics. So we have people working for musical instrument companies. We've mm-hmm. had graduates at Steinway at Ovation Guitar, places like that. Um, then there's outdoor environmental acoustics. And these are also consulting companies, but they would do projects about like noise around airports, mm-hmm. you know, where hundreds of houses are affected just based on the flight patterns of the planes. And so that involves a lot of outdoor measurements as well as computer modeling so that you can make decisions that will end up impacting thousands of lives rather than just onesie twosies. Mm -hmm. Then there's the whole area of uh, bioacoustics that includes hearing aid design as well as ultrasound. So you've got medical ultrasound checking. How's the baby doing? Is the Mm -hmm. umbilical cord around the neck or is it going to come out feet first? And, but it's such a safe way because you're not using x-rays. You're just literally using sound waves to be able to see inside and, and help people with so many different therapies that use ultrasound. It's a, it's a great field if you're into acoustics, but also want to help people mm. you know, with their lives. And then finally, there's noise control itself. So these would be big companies that they themselves have their own acoustics department as part of what they do. Mm -hmm. So one example would be jet engine companies. So Pratt and Whitney is right here in East Hartford, Connecticut. They have, of course, engineers trying to make more power or better fuel economy. But there's an entire department just trying to make these things quieter because it's such a big deal around airports. Mm, Yeah. Um, There's also 
Uh, car companies all have what's called a noise, vibration, and harshness department, NVH, if you read car magazines. Their whole idea is to design the car so that it rides really smooth, super quiet on the inside, and has an incredible sound system. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're working for Ford, your NVH department, maybe you don't want it to be super quiet because people are paying to buy that Mustang to have that sound be readily apparent to the occupant. So the goals are different depending on what product it is. Yeah. Uh, and the last one in that category would be a place like General Dynamics Electric Boat. So Electric Boat is all of our submarines are designed and built right here in Southeastern Connecticut. And so there's two things going there. Stealth, mm -hmm. the ability to make our subs undetectable by other uh, subs, mm -hmm. as well as sonar, mm -hmm. which is really yeah. ultrasound, but underwater. Yeah. Being able to, uh, you know, detect other objects underwater. So we've got people in all six areas. And, you know, that's the thing that always strikes me about this field is when you initially hear the term, it sounds like it's a, you're in a niche mm -hmm. aspect of engineering. But instead, when you look at these six different areas, you know, it it pulls from music, it pulls mm -hmm. from architecture, it pulls from biology, it pulls from all these different areas. And so while maybe not everybody stays in the same career for the entire life, uh, <laughs> people move on. Uh, there's lots of choices. So we've ha literally had people work six, seven, eight years in one of those six that I just mentioned and go to something completely different. And that way their life continues to be uh, uh, full of interest. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating as you start rattling through those, I, I'm, I just start thinking about that. Okay. The, the, the building trades themselves, right? How mm -hmm. do you build uh, drywall walls right. that you don't hear your neighbor, right? you you see all mm -hmm. these townhouses all over the place. And exactly. One of those fears is, okay, can you hear what's going on in the house next to you? And, and obviously all of this type of engineering, although the, the application may be uh, structural and mechanical for, for parts of it, acoustical engineering has to play a role in that stuff because nobody wants to be able to hear their neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you made the mention of sound barriers on the highway systems and they have increased how much sound barrier construction they're doing. So we're in the Philadelphia area. And so right. they're, they're putting those walls up and, and right. you'll hear some people like, look at this waste of money, not realizing what the actual reason for them is and how much sound it really does cut down to the neighborhood that right. lives right behind it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the interesting thing about highway noise barriers is while you can calculate a certain benefit, there's other benefits that are not measurable, like out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm, the people mm -hmm. actually think it's quieter than it really might be simply mm -hmm. because they don't see the sound source anymore. I've read something again, preparing for this, uh, retaining information in the classroom and how important it is to limit the sound that comes oh, in yeah. and how much of a factor that plays yeah. into for students. You know, hey, if you have some attention disorders, if you're hearing things through the wall, you might not be able to give the attention that's needed to the teacher to, you know, get a better grade in class. So, you, you know, right. again, never would have thought of that. You know, it's just you get annoyed. Oh, I can hear my neighbor. Oh, I can hear things through the walls. But yeah, there's some right. some fantastic applications for this that can help lots of people. So you make a very good point, Joe. I was actually on a early uh, committee within the Acoustical Society of America, our national uh, professional society that ended up coming up with the ANSI standard called classroom acoustics. Okay. And the whole idea was we not only have people with attention deficit who may find it harder to pay attention in class, but you also have many first generation students who maybe English isn't their first language. Mm -hmm. And the ironic thing is they kept, they wanted to implement this nationwide for all new classes to have these kind of standards because everybody was struck by just how terrible some of the acoustics were, including you'd have the teacher at one end of the room and the back of the room is where they would be this through the wall heater or ventilator, like you yeah. see in a, a hotel mm -hmm. and the students sitting in the back were getting drowned out by the, the noise behind them and couldn't hear the teacher. Mm -hmm. and so all of these kind of things, again, many people just say, well, throw the building together as cheap as possible, right. but there's certain uh, expenses that are worth it in the long run. 
Yeah. So from, from a, a parent student perspective, obviously. So this is, this is kind of no pun intended music to some parents ears here. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, um, there is, you know, I talked about kind of that stigma, that head trash of, you know, you, your kid's got to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. We have these preconceived notions of what success, what right. successful career paths are. And for those people that never thought, hey, I could be an engineer um, and they have that love for music and they have that love for sound and they have that that whole thing. Right. All of a sudden you're combining those two together in in you know, a a group of areas of study, I would call it, but the idea that you can be an engineer and you can love music and you can pursue that as a, as a component of your, you know, what is, I don't know if we call it socially acceptable majors, but you know, there there's the parents that obviously their heart and intention is in the right spot to say, you need to be an engineer because they want them to be successful and gainfully employed and all that. Um, But I don't think the students or the parents know enough about this type of, area of study because you know, everybody knows about the, the, the big three, the EE, the mechanical, you know, the right. electrical and um, the structural and civil, but you don't hear about some of these more obscure ones. Um, right. And I, I shouldn't say obscure. I, I don't mean any, any less well known. With that. Yes. Um, so you've won some awards for your teaching. You've been highly regarded in this field. What, what, what kind of sets you and then in turn the university of Hartford apart in this area? Well, that acoustical engineering and music degree I mentioned is unique in the whole country. And believe me, I've looked. Okay. Uh, and I think it's just a happy circumstance. My mentor, when I was here as a student, Conrad Heeman, he was actually friends with a professor over in the music school, Bill Willett. And they would have lunch together every day. And over lunch, over many years, they exchanging uh, thoughts. Uh, one day they discussed the idea that, you know, I often get students who come here interested in engineering, but they also have a musical background and they don't want to give it up when they get to mm-hmm. the end of college, but they don't want to end up just doing music. And so literally on the back of a napkin one day, they came up with the core of what this program still is to this day. Um, And so I really have to give him credit for kind of thinking outside of the box. And another comment I want to make about the acoustical engineering and music program and its uniqueness is that these are not just two separate uh, subjects that are just glommed together. Mm -hmm. They're actually very synergistic because the acoustical engineering and music, music part of the program, you're not only doing private music lessons in band, but you're doing music theory, ear training these types of classes. So you're developing this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what we use as acoustical engineers. When we first come into a room with horrible acoustics, we don't break out the equipment. We might just clap and then just listen very Mm -hmm. carefully. And so the more developed our ear is, the better we are as acoustical engineers. Mm -hmm. And that's why these two subjects just work together so well. Mm. So that's the uniqueness uh, I think we offer here. At University of Hartford, and and so aside from the the music and acoustics combined program, how many schools out there offer acoustical engineering programs? Well, the vast majority that do that are at the graduate level. Okay, so we're also very unique to actually find it as an undergraduate level. Okay, but there's places like Penn State and Georgia Tech and Notre Dame and Purdue. Okay. that have uh, graduate programs, well-established graduate programs. And a certain percentage of our graduates, maybe 10 or 15% in a given school uh, graduating class will decide to go on to grad school, even though our undergrad more than qualifies you to start in any of those six areas that I just described. And with those six areas, you know, again, taking your, like you had the uh, engineering with the, you know, specializing in the acoustics, right? That, that really looking into that. Right. When students are going through your program, do they start to veer at a certain point, whether it's your two, your three on one of those six areas? Or is it kind of that's more, hey, you're getting trained on all of these. What's kind of all four years? What does that look like? Excellent question. In fact, we purposely starting at sophomore year in the program, the second year, we start incorporating all of these subjects into the classes. So when you 
when I show prospective families these six areas, I tell them you don't have to pick one and you're stuck with it because mm-hmm. they actually get exposed to all six in their coursework. So by the time you get to about junior year or so, you've had enough taste of each one from the buffet. Like, oh, that's pretty yeah. good. Oh, that's enough of that one. And you'll end up uh, deciding which way to at least start your career. Got it. Okay. And I like that because again, well, it just goes to show too. You said a lot of your students that have a job work one, but then go to a different one of those areas right. because they've had experience. That that definitely shows. And yeah, you never know which way you're going to go. We've talked to people about internships, and they may start. They think they want to do one thing, and then they get an internship, and now they have to change their mind. But that might come along with changing a major, extending time in college. Whereas with yours, it's hey, if you're passionate about this, we'll. Here we we can start you here, and that might not be what you thought it was, and now, but there's something right. else that piques your interest, and now you become passionate about, and that's what you end up being a job. I like that, right? And I just want to emphasize, you know, that because ours is an actual engineering program, then that fits in perfectly for us being problem solvers because that's mm-hmm. what engineers do. And you'll see courses within the curriculum, not only in electronics, but even in like material science. Mm-hmm. And the idea is. You know, the piano soundboard in a Steinway is made of Sitka spruce. Well, what if the world runs out of Sitka spruce? Do we just stop making pianos or do we, you know, use our noggin and come up with a new material that actually works as good or better? These types of things that there's no limit to where we can go with this. And that's why all these uh, engineering courses are built into the program on purpose. And and just to be clear uh, and and maybe not clear, but a, a fair question, I hope, is uh, <laughs> some engineering programs are four years, some are five years. What is this engineering program at the University of Hartford? It's four years. And okay. by my observation, those that are five are ones that have built in uh, co-ops. Yeah. So you're, you know, you're going to school, then you're going to work, and then you're going to school and going to work. And what we've worked out with our program is it's a four-year program and we have our students actually start doing meaningful paid internships after sophomore year okay so they'll take the whole summer of sophomore to junior year and the whole summer from junior to senior year and plus we have actual real life projects built into the program as project courses as well so everybody graduates with a working resume by the time they get to senior year of uh, of more than one type of applied project. Uh, So there's a very famous um, symphony hall in Australia. Have you ever been? And is it, is it like, but the next acoustical society meeting next fall is in Sydney. So I'm, I'm saving my pennies. Got it. And, and I, I assume that the, the, you know, in, in all, if you were a structural engineer, you'd want to see one of these twisted towers in Dubai and and just right. observe that. Is, is that like a kind of like a bucket list thing being an a, a acoustical and sound engineer? Uh, yes. I, if I had, uh, you know, a windfall, I think I would take a, a trip around the world visiting various uh, concert halls like in Vienna, oh, yeah, Music yeah. Verein Salt and, you know, the Meyerson down in Dallas, Texas and I've been to Boston Symphony Hall and it's just fantastic. And to be it's able awesome. to hear that luscious reverberation just enveloping you as you're listening to it, uh, I'd love to hear them all. See, and and just you describing the the idea of that being in that symphony hall, it adds a richness that I I me as an untrained ear that didn't work on all the things that you've worked on over the last your entire <laughs> career, like it it makes you sound excited to to hear something like that. Like I, that's awesome. I love it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, We're wildly into it here. My my colleague, his name is uh, Chris Jasinski. Doctor Jasinski and I. He's actually a graduate of the program as well, and and we just love our jobs because every uh, year, because of the extensive experience we have, we get calls from architects, from businesses, from building owners who have acoustical problems and we bank them for the students to work on. That's awesome. So that's what makes uh, it exciting for us to come to work every day. Cause it's, there's a great deal of variety of us working on all six of those areas with projects with our mm-hmm. students. Here at elite collegiate planning, we are able to send students to private schools for nearly a fraction of the cost of public schools. Visit our website, elite to learn more. 
So kind of going back to the college decision-making process for a student and you know they're hearing this podcast and it's like all of a sudden it's it's singing to them again no pun intended but it it was there so i took it um you know what what have you know is there is first of all is there any kind of common trend between all the students that come into this program that you've seen uh historically and what types of things do students explore to try and make a decision because and the reason i ask that is because it is a pretty specific program at a, at a unique institution it's unique program in general so you i would think it's important to find that passion and love first rather than try and explore why you're there and and have to change course well by whatever means i can i usually uh, invite people to come in and meet with us at the university okay. of hartford and part of that is what you see behind me. We have two very, very interesting and completely opposite rooms. The, the What you see behind me is called an anechoic chamber. Mm-hmm. So each of those wedges are made of fiberglass that are like two feet deep. And there's if you clap your hands, there's absolutely no lingering, no reverberation at all. It's like the deadest room you've ever been. Mm-hmm. And we have the exact opposite called a reverberation room, which has all hard surfaces and diffusers hanging in the ceiling. And when you clap in there, the sound lingers for like four to five seconds. So wow. it's a glorious place to sing in. And you go in the anechoic chamber and it's the exact opposite. And so a lot of times that's a, a big eye opener and ear opener for prospective families to come not only talk over the program, but to experience what some of these great test facilities we have here on campus. Got it. So, so, so that's my that, biggest thing is come to campus and, and see and hear the program for yourself. Got it. I love that. And I think, I think, uh, you know, COVID was obviously a challenge to get people out, but right. I, I've been, I've been pushing people so hard to get back to going and visiting and doing and engaging and acting because the decision I made to go to college was I visited the campus, no notification of anybody. I just, mm-hmm. I went to campus and I ended up having a 45 minute conversation with the chair of the economics department. And that basically sold the school for me. Right. He sat down in his office. I knocked on his, I said, Hey, I'm a prospective student. He said, hey, sit down right. 45 minutes. He's just chatting me up, talking about what they do and the types of projects. And so I think that idea of um, the response you get when you go on campus and you come visit and the opportunities to see things, feel things, hear things is very important in, in finding that home for four years. Yeah, Dr. Jasinski and I both always meet with prospective families rather than just a, you know, campus tour. I mm-hmm. tell them, come for the best part, you know, which yeah. is visiting the lab. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, if, if students are interested specifically in the acoustical engineering program, is there a separate application process? Is it more competitive than just getting in to Hartford? Is, the, is it anything different there that families should be aware of? Sure. Well, the... All the applications are online these days. Mm-hmm. And if you pick the acoustical engineering and music, then it will automatically then also uh, take you to a subsection in which you also apply for the admission process for the music school. Okay. And that, that does involve an audition. Mm-hmm. So we have posted on our website, you know, what you can audition in classical music or you can audition in jazz and you know, many, many different instruments. So the audition requirements or the kind of pieces they're looking for are listed there so that you can uh, discuss that with your closest music confidant, you know, show them that list and doesn't have to be those exact pieces, but it'll give you a flavor Mm -hmm. of what types of pieces they're, they're looking for. And the reason why we did this is we wanted to make sure our students, when they're over there at the heart school are able to hold their head up high and say, look, I passed the same audition as anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've never had any uh, issues with those students mixing with the performance majors. They're they're all one big, happy family. Okay. And is that a pretty highly competitive program at the school? Um, I would say it's, it's more individualistic and that is for a given student, you know, when I just meet them, well, I haven't heard them play. So I have no idea how they're going to do in the, uh, audition. Mm-hmm. So that's usually just something that they need to work out as far as looking at the kind of pieces that are expected for the audition uh, versus what their repertoire is to that point. Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, wh- where do you see this 
expansion, this major going, where do you see the kind of the, the future, um, for this type of engineering? Uh, sky's the limit, uh, in, in all six of those areas. I mean, if you think about it for environmental, you know, what used to be farmland is now suburbs and mm -hmm. people are closer and closer together. So these issues of uh, noise and wanting a quiet backyard are not going to go away. Mm -hmm. And if you think about, you know, audio, my gosh, you know, the changes over the last few decades, crazy uh, uh, people listening to mostly just speakers on a stereo at home are now everybody's just got their earbuds in mm -hmm. and the earbuds have built in microphones. And there's also speech recognition and you're talking to Siri and mm -hmm. all of these things. These are all acoustical engineering uh, driven by those types of engineers. Uh, so any of those areas, plus I seem to add to my master list in class that I go over when we're discussing medical ultrasound, I'm adding something new every year mm -hmm. of uh, new uh, therapies. Maybe you remember uh, Peyton Manning retired from football because he had very bad plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. And now just in the last year, the FDA has approved medical ultrasound to treat plantar fasciitis. And it used to be if they operated on you, you know, with knives, you didn't walk for months, mm -hmm. but now with medical ultrasound, you're walking within weeks. So it's and, very fascinating to just mm -hmm. see how the technology continues to grow. And there's so many acoustic areas that are benefited by that. Okay. You, you've got me now. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued. What in medical ultrasound can and and my understanding of plantar fasciitis is half right okay. it, it's tendon on the bottom of the foot comes around the heel and it it right. it, it causes excruciating pain mm -hmm. um what can an ultrasound do to that or what's the what's the logic theory or what, how does that work well it's basically here healing the tissue so okay. it's able okay. to give the tissue the type of uh wave frequencies and intensity levels that actually encouraging, you know, take up of extra fluid. And, mm. and it, it's a way, a, a better example might be to think about, you can use medical ultrasound if you have terrible back spasms. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever had them, somebody might come over and say, oh, well, let me massage you. But they're trying to get at that tightness from the outside in. Mm -hmm. Well, medical ultrasound actually vibrates you from the inside out. So it actually goes right to the cause of where the muscles are the tightest and it just loosens them and just you get a very nice warm feeling in your muscle and and you feel better. So so is it fair to say that we haven't even we haven't even gotten nearly as as deep on that as as we could possibly go because we don't know the limits of of what type of healing or what type of power that that Fre Correct. Those frequencies can achieve. Correct. That's amazing. It, it's absolutely happening. Even uh, using ultrasound to help uh, get medicines to get through the blood brain barrier mm -hmm. for people with brain tumors where you, you normally the blood brain barrier will stop any medicine from getting from your uh, vein or from your spinal uh, fluid to the brain. It's trying to protect itself, but some experiments have been going on. It hasn't been used in humans yet, but where they have found the right ultrasonic frequency that will actually open up that blood brain barrier long enough for the medicine to get through. Mm. And then as soon as they turn it off, the blood brain barrier goes back to normal. It's so fascinating. Burning man with this on mammals, but someday again, you just think how many lives could be saved or people's yep. lives could be uh, mm. improved. Yeah. Well, and, and how much, how, how much can we remove the invasive procedures because right. of the, yeah. the, what we learn and grow and understand based on sound frequencies and things like that? I mean, right. It's, exactly. It's, when you say sky's the limit, it really is. It, it's, it, can we conceive it and is there an application for it? And can we, can we execute that? And right. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, there's a procedure called lithotripsy, which is using medical ultrasound to help people pass kidney stones mm. and kidney stones. They say, you know, next to childbirth, it's like the next uh, most painful thing that you can go through. Well, I guess for, for us, uh, that is the most painful thing yeah. you can go through. Uh, and just imagine trying to pass a grape seed, you know, through that particular piece of plumbing. Well, what the medical ultrasound does is it literally breaks it apart. So you're just passing 
little tiny bits um, yeah. without having to cut somebody open. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, we- non-invasive. Uh, Topical. Correct. And, and a more natural solution, right? right. Your, your body is passing it in its own, its own, right. I mean, that's, that's right. tremendous. And if you think about that, like it, you could, you could expand the thought of what is possible with tumors and I don't, I'm not right. a doctor. I'm not, but is there some application here where that is usable or it, it causes something to reduce or go away mm-hmm. or you just don't know. Exactly. And so the, uh, the whole idea of, engineers pushing the state of the art is very, very prevalent in, in acoustics. Absolutely. It, so, so that begs a question from my perspective, right? You hear about biomedical engineering uh, and now we have this application of acoustical engineering in biomedical engineering right. and, and the kind of, so these crossover components. And, and I've always said that, you know, back in the day there was the big three, And some, you know, nuclear came along and there's, and they've, but engineering, the more we learn, the more we kind of come back and create new passive engineering. And all of a sudden you have these, you know, there's there's probably 25 different engineering majors that you can have now. And I think when you start combining, you know, acoustic and biomedical, and all of a sudden you have a very specialized engineering pathway that, that goes down a whole new track and you're basically creating more engineering. It's fascinating. Absolutely. And our, our students who work in that area are working side by side with biomed engineers and it makes for a great team because each yeah. has their own background of uh, specialized courses that a- enable them to understand what the bigger picture is. Yeah. Absolutely. So one of the, one of the things that always intrigues me when, when someone is as distinguished as you are and have, have won some serious accolades and awards, um, how did you do it differently than others? How did you get, successfulness what do you do better as a professor than others what is it the passion is it just the commitment is it just you love it so you can't stop (laughs) right all of the above and honestly you know i think i substitute taught one one day during grad school when my professor was under the weather uh but other than that when i first got here to start teaching i hadn't done any student teaching at all ever and all i said well how am i going to do this and I just literally just golden ruled it and said, if I was out there sitting in the seat, which wasn't that long ago, what would I want to hear? Yeah, and what would yeah. make sense to me? So I just always just went into class and explained it as if I was explaining it to my younger self sitting in the classroom. And that, besides that, they, I always get high check marks for enthusiasm. Got it. So between those two things, I think that's what's helped me uh, over the years. And that was your graduate programs at Penn State, correct? When I did the one day substitute teaching exactly and how different i just i love this kind of juxtaposition now you the university of hartford undergrad and then you go to penn state for your your two graduate degrees right how different were the environments there how different were this was the studying there was was one f- you know you you had this music component at hartford but it hadn't right. been combined into a major yet but your mentor and another mentor i assume they had the cups of coffee created the groundwork for the major that you now have right. made a career um right. how different was the the penn state world well uh, two aspects one fortunately the program is and i think was uh, relatively small so the class sizes were similar at the grad mm-hmm. level, as I was enjoying at University of Hartford, you know, 15, mm-hmm. 20 at the most. Uh, but, you know, on my way back from uh, one particular class, I, I cut through the physics building one day at Penn State and I went by lecture hall and I saw like a 350 seat, you know, physics one lecture going on. And down in the front was not the teacher, but a graduate assistant, you know, mm-hmm. speaking. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I had if I had gone to school here for undergrad, you know, I'd have been eaten alive. So my personal impression was I, I greatly benefited from the small size and the ability to just go into uh, any professor's office and mm-hmm. just have some armchair discussions about various topics, as well as getting help help on my studying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, and I think that's another thing that the as a student and a, a parent of a student thinking about a prospective university, 
you got to think about that stuff Mm because I had the same experience. I went to a very small school. I mean, I, my classes, I I remember I had the smallest class I ever had, but there were six people. It was economic game theory and we got so deep and so intense. And it was this, you know, just, it's almost like a mastermind group as opposed to a classroom. Right. Um, and you don't have that opportunity all the time. Now, as you, as you matriculate up and you get to the higher level classes that some of that stuff will, will thin out. But again, do you learn in that auditorium setting? Do you learn in those large lecture halls? Uh, do you need that, that touch? Um, I think is all important to, to understand. Right. Yeah. And I think that's why we're, we benefited when the internet came along that we actually have people now from California who've come here from Wisconsin right now, from Alaska, from Florida, uh, from Missouri, all across the country because of how unique it is. Mm-hmm. And that also, when you combine that with the small classes and you start, these, I see the students talking with each other. It's very cool to, to see people from different areas of the country kind of gel. Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's, and it's, and it's cool when it's a passion that, that gels right. everybody together. Right. And right. It doesn't and matter. Kindred spirits, you know, yeah. it was very have cool. both chops with music and with uh, technology. These are some great takeaways for parents. You know, we're talking about class size and finding that right fit. And it's great to hear where kids are coming from. Right. I know a lot of parents always where, and potentially students, they should be thinking about this is the back end. Right. And look, sometimes kids graduate with loans and you have to have a starting salary that's high enough to right. cover, to be able to live, not have to live with mom and dad. What in doing quick research seems like acoustical engineering, very good starting salary out of college. You know? Right. Um, yeah. But I'm curious in your world, do you see that are there certain areas of the country that if this is the pathway you would like to go, that you're going to have to move to? Like, are there certain areas? Like, if you're coming from Wisconsin, if you go back to Wisconsin, are there jobs available there? Do you have to stay in California, Massachusetts? What's what's that look like in your world? What have you seen? Um, well, obviously, there's more firms in the bigger cities like Chicago, <laughs> New York, San Francisco, L.A., and so forth. But there are firms that are all over the country. So, uh, Starkey's like the largest hearing aid company in the, in the United States, and they're in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, other loudspeaker companies are out in you know rural areas of the Midwest, and microphone companies like Shure are in the Midwest. Uh, so there's definitely opportunities all across the country, and we have uh, a lot of ability to network with our alums who are at these positions yeah. to g- give them a heads up about a, somebody who's about to retire and they haven't advertised for a replacement okay. yet, you know, send in your resume. Um, so the students, you know, it's easy enough on the internet these days to start looking mm-hmm. up different companies and find out, well, where are their offices? Mm-hmm. And uh, many have multiple offices across the country. So that um, sometimes there's something very close to where they are from others, uh, you know, within driving distance. Yeah. So you you mentioned sure we're talking to two sure microphones. So I love it. We, at least, I guess we, I guess you mentioned the company. So I'm guessing we did something right with this. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Now, if I could only get paid to tell that I'm using sure microphones on the show, then then we'd be in, we'd be in the money. So I have a giant pet peeve and that's when I go to a restaurant and I can't hear anything. Right. And like, it's not that I can't hear because, well, I, I do have hearing issues. Well, I, I probably abused, you know, power tools well, and other things too long. It's as filtering. A yeah. Filter. I can't filter at all. Um, any tricks, anything that I can do. I mean, other than like, I literally will do this and right. cut, cut my ear to get sound coming in one direction. Well, see if you can, you know, when you first come in, try to get a booth like towards the back you know, against a wall rather than sitting in the middle where you're completely surrounded by clinking glasses and murmuring mm-hmm. conversations. So the more distance that you can get with just uh, plain walls behind you, the better. Got it. But honestly, you know, some restaurants like purposely don't want to put in any acoustical material because they want to create like a buzz. Mm. But I'm I'm with you. It's just too... Uh, excruciating you yeah, know like i can hear everything and it's just like I can't, ah. right exactly and you know that also is an you, you could get 
checked out for hearing loss because in addition to like being unable to hear quiet sounds, we also can uh, suffer from lack of ability to filter. Mm. And when they give you a conventional hearing aid, all that is is a miniature PA system that just makes everything louder. And Got it's kind of like you sit down to read the paper and you're like, oh, I, lo- I left my glasses at work. They're like, oh, here, I'll just turn up the light brighter for you. And you're like, I'm not blind. <laughs> yeah. you know, I need to focus. Yeah. And that's what the complaint is with the filtering is everything's coming in at once and you can't distinguish one thing from yeah. another. Got it. Interesting. I need to get checked for filtering. So <laughs> it's on the list. Yeah. Doctor's orders. And uh, my last question is actually going to come from our uh, audience members here. Uh, our producers behind the screen held up a big sign and said, please ask about acoustic levitation. Okay. Is that right? Guy? Okay. So right. it's, it's, it's just more of a parlor trick. To be honest, I mean, you know, ping pong balls have a certain amount of weight, but they're not super heavy. Yeah. And you can actually, using conccentrated sound waves, you can make the things dance in the air Got it. without touching it. Okay. And they've now, if you have an array of loudspeakers underneath, kind of like a, a chessboard where every square is a different transducer, then you can actually sit there with a keyboard and move the ping pong ball you know, around the square by changing the phase of what's being sent to each little transducer square. Hmm. And so it's keeping it levitated, but you can also move things around. So the thing, the thought is that that could somehow help hands-free, you know, precision movements of things. But right now, you know, you're already making the thing scream pretty loud just to hold a ping pong ball in the air. So to hold something else that's heavier would probably be uh, pretty noisy. Got it. Which is the other balancing act that you guys uh, specialize in is trying to reduce noise too. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> which one do we want here? Um, no, I, I, I think it's is a, as a fascinating subject. Um, if, uh, if students want to visit university of Hartford or, or get engaged with this, just go to the website and reach what out. Send me an email. Got it. It's my last name, Selmer, C-E-L-M-E-R, at hartford.edu. Love it. That's amazing. This is this is uh, some, this is some cool stuff, and I, I could probably ask questions for hours because I have, like I'm thinking, I went to this one restaurant in this hotel in Florida, and I looked up at the ceiling, and they had timbers. The timbers were right. about, it was soft wood timbers. They were probably mm-hmm. about an inch and a half thick, and they were like two by 12s, right? Mm-hmm. Hanging. Right. And it was the most peaceful environment I'd ever heard in my life. And I mean, yep. and they were, they were hanging every and different, different heights, different lengths. So like right. it just captured every noise. I didn't hear a thing. And I was like, I need to do this. And we have a, or the building that we're in is built in 1810 is the loudest building on the planet. Right. Is, everything <laughs> is very hard. Uh, and it, right. the sound bounces and, and I've been trying to figure out, other than buying acoustical panels for the wall, which again, question for you, do they work? I'm sure that some work better than others, but what is the key right. that I need to do to reduce sound in a tall ceiling room? Well, you'd want to basically characterize exactly what is the room doing right now, behavior wise. And that basic test is called the reverberation test. So if you just imagine if you've ever been on a very reflective stairwell, if you clapped your hands once, you'd hear a shh. Yeah, and it kind of claps up and yeah. And you hear it smear down slowly with time. Well, knowing that reverberation time is is measured in seconds. Mm -hmm. If you then take the volume of the room, how many cubic feet does that room entail? Mm -hmm. You can compare what the reverberation time should be for a room of that size being used for a particular purpose. If the purpose is for speech, you'd want that reverberation a lot lower. If Mm. it's used for music, you'd want it higher because that reverberation envelops you and makes the music sound so celestial. So that enables you to settle arguments like this room has all the acoustics. And the other person's like, are you crazy? Or are you, or are you <laughs> right? The best acoustics I've ever heard. <laughs> Let me get my guitar. <laughs> right. Exactly. So you have to say, uh, let's do this the, the thinking person's way. And that is characterize exactly what the room's doing. And then compare it to what it should be doing 
based on its uh, use. Got it. And then that sets you a goal, and then you can calculate exactly how many acoustic panels you need to meet that goal. Mm-hmm. How about it? It's science, people. Exactly. Love it. And uh, what, last question, I'll ask just out of curiosity, walls or ceiling more important? Uh, both, really. Yeah. And, okay. and it, you know, the depends part comes in with, well, how high is the ceiling? You know, the closer it is to the people, then it becomes even more important. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Dr. Selmer, this is fantastic. My favorite episodes are ones where I end up looking at Dave afterward and saying, all right, well, I, my kid, my oldest is about to be 10. You know, he's in fourth grade and, you know, I, I, in years, uh, episodes past, I'm like, oh, if he's interested in a co-op, hey, I'm going to be looking at Northeastern. He's playing the saxophone right now. If this is something and he is looking at math and science, we will see you in about eight years. And that's ultimately what I love about these episodes. Is fantastic. I may not have known about this. And, and I think that's ultimately this is really the message that we try to deliver with this with this podcast is people may not know that this right. program exists. So really, thank you so much. This was with this was fantastic. It's not right. even the program exists, but the application, well, yeah. we went, we talked yeah. about nuclear submarines and stealth <laughs> technology <laughs> underwater to the symphony orchestra hall, right? Like, I mean, right. th- this is exactly. and sound barriers on roadways. The application is insane. And I think it's, again, as I said, in the very beginning, our message is to kind of bring knowledge to people that don't know it. And so right. you've taught me more in, in an hour about acoustical engineering than, I knew to exist. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, sure. The often we have awkward moments during the visits where the parents get so enthused that they're like, <laughs> I want to come here too. And I, I jokingly look at the students and say, yeah, and you guys could be in the same dorm. And the students like, look at them, they're like, shut up. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right, everybody. This has been College Knowledge with Dr. Bob Selmer from uh, the University of Hartford. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining the show. Most welcome. Thanks. All Great right. To be take here. care. Bye-bye. If you didn't know, we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Elite Collegiate Planning. Make sure to share and tag us. Thanks for listening to the College Knowledge Podcast with your hosts, Dave Kozak and Joe Kearns. We hope you enjoyed this week's exploration of higher education, sponsored by the College Planning Network and Paradigm Financial Group. That's all for this episode. See you next time.